everyone. I'm Lana Zak. Thank you so much for joining me. This week marks one month since George Floyd died at the hands of Minneapolis police officers. Floyd was pinned to the ground as an officer knelt on his neck for more than eight minutes. His death sparked nationwide protests against racial injustice and calls for police reform. On Thursday, the House took up a bill named in his honor. Skyler Henry has more from Washington. The House is prepared to pass a police reform bill on the one-month anniversary of George Floyd's death. It was not until the advent of the cell phone camera that the stories of police abuse were finally exposed to the world. Before then, the deaths were simply disregarded, not believed, not acknowledged. The bill includes a ban on chokeholds and would make it easier to file civil lawsuits against officers accused of misconduct. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act will fundamentally transform the culture of policing to address systemic racism, curb police brutality, and bring accountability to our police departments. Republicans say Democrats blocked every amendment they proposed. Never consulted us on the creation of this bill. I have reached out to those on the Democrat side, explaining that I wanted to make law. I wanted to work together, and I still do. Senate Democrats made the same complaint before blocking a Republican police reform bill Wednesday. President Trump says he won't support any bill that hurts police. He's also ordering U.S. Marshals to work with local police to stand guard around statues on federal land across the country. The president says he will sign an executive order to further protect the statues. And he tweeted that they are some of our great works of art that represent our history and heritage. I think many of the people that are knocking down these statues don't even have any idea what the statue is, what it means, who it is. The Army has activated, but not yet deployed, 400 members of the Washington, D.C. National Guard to prevent any further damage to the monuments. And Skylar Henry joins me now. Hi, Skylar. In your piece, we saw the president address the removal of Confederate statues. Demonstrators say these monuments are a symbol of racism against the black community and America's very troubling past. But President Trump says he's going to sign an executive order to protect them. What more do we know about this and what steps has the administration taken so far? Well, hey, Lana, good evening to you. From what we know, the president is essentially promising to prosecute any protester who damages uh, these uh, statues uh, at any given moment. In a tweet earlier this week, he said that he wants people to serve up to 10 years in prison for violating these statues on federal property. You can see behind me, this is a statue here. Uh, right in front of the White House, there's actually a fence that was put up in the last day or so pr blocking protesters who were once able to get inside Lafayette Square Park. Uh, now they are not able to do so. There's also one right here at uh, St. John's Church that uh, wasn't here a few days ago as well. And so now we see all of these protective measures in place to make sure that people are not able uh, to take down these statues. Now, this is all across the country and here in D.C. We were at a park earlier today, the uh, Emancipation memorial, I should say, and that statue had Abraham Lincoln kind of overseeing a, uh, a slave, if you will, being uh, trying to free the slave. And so the plans are to uh, take that statue down for tomorrow. We'll see what happens with that situation between demonstrators and police moving forward. But what I can tell you is that there are a lot of measures in place to make sure that this does not happen. You heard in the piece, President Trump is considering putting the U.S. Marshals out here to work with local law enforcement to protect these statues as well well as the National Guard themselves, Lana. Yeah, a lot of force and energy being put into protecting these statues. Uh, I was mm -hmm. amazed when I heard vandalism could result in up to 10 years in prison. I'm wondering, Skylar, are other Republicans supporting these actions or are they distancing themselves from the president on this issue? Well, you don't hear much from other Republicans, but as you heard the president say, he thinks that this uh, recognizes our history and our heritage uh, in terms of these statues. Obviously, demonstrators see this as a completely different point of view, representing uh, an oppressed culture uh, in, in our nation's history, particularly when you're speaking of black people, quite frankly, and, and, and in particular, these Confederate monuments. Now, you'll have uh, other people come out to say, well, what about people like George Washington and, and, and Thomas Jefferson and things like that? We heard Kayleigh McEnany, the uh, president's press secretary, speak to that yesterday, saying that it actually makes zero sense for people 
careful to be targeting uh, those statues. But you, when, you, you, when you take into the perspective of the fact that people here, at least some of the people that we spoke with, have said things like, well, no, these people owned slaves as well, or these people were a part of the culture that oppressed my people centuries ago, then you wonder where the conversation goes from there. But the president has made it very clear. He does not want to see any more of these statues vandalized or toppled over. Or, and if that is the case, then people will be facing serious consequences. We also saw that the uh, Department of Justice is looking into 200 plus cases of vandalism in terms of statues across the country. So you can see that not only the Trump administration taking it seriously, but the DOJ as well. But does President Trump see any difference between, say, a, uh, a monument um, of George Washington and a Confederate soldier mm -hmm. who fought to keep um, African people or African Americans, black people, enslaved? There's no mm -hmm. difference in mm -hmm. the president's mind whatsoever? Well, it's rhetoric that we haven't heard from him uh, up until this point. Uh, he has called for, uh, obviously, law enforcement on the local and uh, federal levels to step in when he has seen these things happen across the country, obviously in Minneapolis, obviously in, in places like Virginia, and, I mean, really all over the country where these statues exist. He has said that it is improper for these people to be uh, vandalizing these statues moving forward. And so now you see this response uh, uh, from uh, law enforcement, from the uh, orders of the president. Now, how that's going to land on demonstrators, that remains to be seen. Obviously, it's a peaceful day here on Black Lives Matter Plaza. That's where we are today. But we were out here last week, and it was a little tense. Uh, we were out here a few days ago, and it was a little tense. So it remains to be seen just what the the the, the atmosphere will be like when you have uh, a significant police presence joined with a number of protesters calling for some sort of change, particularly when it comes to things like police reform, Lana. Hmm. Well, speaking of that, the House Thursday took up the Justice in uh, Policing Act of 2020 in honor of George Floyd. Republicans have opposed the bill. The bill. Meanwhile, Democrats shot down the Republican Senate bill on Wednesday, arguing that it doesn't go far mm -hmm. enough to address police brutality. Skyler, uh, when you're looking at all of this, does it look like there is a path mm -hmm. forward, or will partisan politics really block police reform legislation, at least until the November election? Well, at least up until this point, I mean, it looks like it's going to be gridlock, right, when you're talking about police reform. Just yesterday, we heard from Senator Tim Scott, who vocalized his frustrations with the Democrats' inability to uh, to respond to some of the amendments or to, uh, to try to move forward his uh, proposals in terms of wanting police reform. And then we heard today from Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who essentially said the same thing, but on the opposite side. He said that there's no chance that the House's police reform bill will even make it to the Senate floor for a vote. So now what we're going to see is that, that partisan politics as usual. But was it, what was interesting yesterday, though, is we heard from Senator Tim Scott, who said that he brought uh, police reform up five years ago when the incident happened with Walter Scott down in South Carolina and he didn't see anything happen there. He had that same frustration yesterday saying that once uh, recesses start to happen and other things start to uh, occur, obviously we're still dealing with a pandemic here. Uh, he feels as though this uh, conversation about police reform is going to fall by the wayside or unless, you know, something tragic happens again that demands the nation's attention, then the conversation will happen again. But certain, certain Democrats have said, hey, listen, this is not going to happen again. We're going to stay on this. The Democrats have really said up until this point what the GOP has proposed doesn't have uh, enough teeth. The GOP has said that the Democrats, uh, their proposals are simply too strong in terms of what they're demanding in terms of police officers. And it doesn't really seem like anybody's really ready to come to the table in terms of demand or uh, in terms of wanting to uh, create any sort of substance and change to their uh, proposals respectively. And so now what is happening is, as you said, you know, politics as usual. We're waiting to see what will happen move forward, uh, moving forward. Uh, the House is probably going to pass this bill. But as I mentioned, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said that there's no no chance that this moves forward out of that. A lot of disappointing news coming out of Washington. Skyler Henry, thank you. All right, Lana, thank you. The Supreme Court sided with the Trump administration in a major deportation case on Thursday. In a 7-2 ruling, the justice said 
alum seekers can, uh, asylum seekers rather, cannot appeal fast track deportation orders in federal court. The Supreme Court is also expected to rule on a number of other cases within the coming weeks. Those include the potential release of President Trump's tax returns and abortion rights. For more on all of this, let's bring in Loyola Law School professor Jessica Levinson. Jessica, the American Civil Liberties Union argued this case on behalf of an asylum seeker who was placed under expedited deportation. What more can you tell us about that case and how it made its way to the Supreme Court? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of picking up on your last segment, speaking of the bad news coming in, ultimately effective. So what happened in this is that there was a Sri Lankan farmer who uh, came to the U.S. via Mexico came here uh, illegally and said, I'm seeking asylum. He was denied that asylum. And because of this expedited review, he was not allowed to challenge that denial in federal court. The ACLU sued and they said, he is entitled to that constitutional protection, that constitutional protection of essentially seeking review called habeas corpus and due process, which essentially means you get your moment to challenge uh, the decision that's just made, been made against you. And today, the Supreme Court said, no, you don't. And the line that the Supreme Court really drew was between people who are in this country legally and people who are in this country illegally, even if they are seeking asylum. So how has the ACLU responded to the Supreme Court's ruling? Uh, well, not well. So if you look at what the ACLU said, if you look at what was in the dissent, uh, the dissent is a vigorous dissent joined by, by Justice Sonia Sotomayor, joined by Justice Elena Kagan. And she said, this goes against our bedrock constitutional principles. This goes against the idea that if you are in this country, you get protection, you get individual rights protection. And it takes this power away from federal judges. So federal judges, Justice Sotomayor says in her dissent, federal judges are there to protect individual liberties. They're there to make sure that there is an overreach for